basically Rockefeller, Morgan people. Those that group, uh, you probably know something in that area. Colonel House was there. involved uh, there, uh, and the Woodrow Wilson uh, people were there. Although this occurred, I believe, in 1910 or so when they met at Jekyll Island. Yes, that's right. It was a couple of years uh, later. By the time it got planned, it was finally passed in 1913. It was kind of sneaked through Congress, and uh, Wilson actually signed that into law, the Federal Reserve Act, like two days before Christmas. And when many of the senators and congressmen, of course, with transportation in 1913 being what it was, they had long since left the nation capital, many of them. But the ones that they wanted to stay and vote did stay and vote. Wilson signed the law uh, two days before Christmas. And traditionally, hasn't that been a period where, by gentlemen's agreement, that important legislation is not enacted right around the Christmas holiday? It may be a gentleman's agreement, but that's generally the time that I was always most vigilant because I realized that's when most of the garbage <laughs> would be passed and most of the more honest. You know, on the last day of the session is unbelievable. Stacks and stacks of pieces of legislation come in and nobody reads anything. So the worst things happen at that particular time, but it is supposed to be that if the members aren't attending that they wouldn't be doing these kind of things. But uh, you're absolutely right, there was a very low attendance and, and uh, it, was, uh, it was an unusual year because generally Congress didn't meet that late in the year and I don't know whether they were called back in the session or what, but it was unusual for Congress back in those days. Now it's very common to meet all year round. So but back then they were usually only in session two or three months of the year. But here they were in session in December, very unusual year. And one of the most important pieces of legislation certainly in our history kind of just rushed through at the last minute without anyone really paying that much attention to it. And, uh, I think it's so interesting. There, there were a lot of people who weren't fooled. They, uh, a lot of the congressmen from the western part of the United States, even the south more populous areas, weren't uh, fooled by what was happening. They recognized it as a gravy train going to the bankers, so uh, they naturally were opposed to it. And uh, in reading uh, the book Secret of the Federal Reserve, it, I thought it was fascinating that the bankers set up an organization to complain about this Federal Reserve uh, Act, which was there, they were secretly, which they secretly hatched up, and they were secretly uh, uh, trying to get passed. But they complained that it was going to kill them, just so it would, uh, the people would think that, oh well, we're going to pass this, and it'll harness the banks. Yet they were literally getting a license to steal because that uh, really permitted this fractional reserve banking system to occur where they can pyramid their deposits, loan out money that they don't even have. So it was a tremendous benefit to the bankers. You know, nothing of this that you'll, you'll find in uh, history books or books on government or the economic history of the United States. Nothing about how this no, came We're about. certainly not teaching it in school. Not, not in, in history public, classes. Not in the public schools. Hopefully we will see that it gets taught somewhere. Let's come forward from 1913 to the Depression era and the role that the Fed played in that, the inflation-deflation cycle. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, a lot of people, uh, and you can still find in history books, that uh, the economists were reassured in the 1920s that there was no inflation. Prices were relatively stable, and they always uh, said that inflation was rising prices. But if you look at the monetary history, there was a lot of monetary inflation during the 1920s, and the money, instead of going into production, it went into speculation. Of course, it bid up the price of stocks and real estate, and then it finally came to that time when uh, there is concern or they make the decision, look, I think we think we can not only save the dollar and stop the inflation, but we can make some money on it. They say, we're going to have to turn this off, so they cut back on the credit, and it caused the stock market crash. And of course, then the Great Depression followed. Uh, the inf previous inflation always leads to a correction of a, of, a, of a recession or depression. But if you compare what happened in the 1920s, very similar to what's happening here in the 1980s, and you just think about how many times you read in the last six or eight years that the government's told us there's nothing to worry about, there's no inflation. Well, there's been a greater expansion of money now than there was in the 20s. Of course, there was a greater speculation in the stock market and a bigger stock market crash. So I anticipate, and many Austrian free market economists anticipate, that the recession that's coming will not be a recession at all. It'll be a depression. It'll probably be bigger than the one we had in the 1930s because it will be the correction for all the malinvestment, all the mistakes made because of this artificial credit pumped in 
by the Federal Reserve System. So we have to look for the correction. The next president will be blamed for the Depression, but it is that they shouldn't get to blame. It should be the Federal Reserve policy and the Reagan administration and the Congress today who have run up the debts and created the new money that has set the stage for the next recession. The next recession or slant depression, if it becomes that, do you have a, an idea in mind for when that might begin? I, we see all these books out now, the Great Depression of 1990. And I have an idea, but the most important thing about Austrian economics is that you cannot project precisely because events occur with emotional aspects, human beings making decisions. That's why, uh, although many, including myself, kept saying there's going to be a stock market, but I didn't know it was going to be October 19th. It could have been October 10th or it could have been November 15th. I mean, I mean, it comes when people just get frightened and scared and panic. Uh, so Austrian economics teaches that, yes, we know a depression is coming, but we don't know the day it's going to start. But still, a lot of people say, well, what do you think? Because uh, you just have to uh, make a judgment for personal and financial reasons. I think it's going to, there's going to be another major financial event before the end of this year, close to the election, more likely before than afterwards. And that by next year, next spring, it'll be very clear that this country is moving rapidly into a recession. We put that question to Congressman Gonzalez, your uh, uh, former colleague on the Housing Banking uh, Currency Committee. And I said, uh, well, I've been reading a lot about uh, how the next president is going to be the next Herbert Hoover. And he said, if we're lucky, the Depression will wait that long. Yeah, and I wouldn't argue a whole lot, uh, but, <laughs> but time is running short. Here we are in uh, August already, and uh, um, a recession could start tomorrow or the next day. It could be very clear. I think, matter of fact, the standard of living has been going down. I think history is going to show that uh, the country has been down on the down slope maybe for the past 10 years. It's just not going rapidly and it's not confirmed by the government statistics, but they're changing all the time. They use GNP figures to reassure us everything is okay and 40% of the GNP is government spending and where do they get the money? They print it. And uh, also, uh, you know, like for CPI, they change in that. If it's going up too fast, they change the way they calculate it. But if you go to the average guy on the street and say, is your cost of living going up? He says, I can't even pay my bills. I'm not even buying steak anymore. And uh, so things are a lot worse than the government would lead us to believe. Can we get back to this matter of political power, econ economic power, and control of the economy? Uh, were you in Congress when Wright Patman was still there? No, but I was in Congress when his son was there. Okay. I think it's Bill Patman that uh, was there, but uh, I didn't know Wright Patman. Wright Patman, of course, was the chairman of the banking committee right. at one time, and he had some good ideas about the Federal Reserve. Oh, he had, uh, in my studies on the American power structure, it was a real gold mine because his committee, the one which you uh, came on later, made studies of how the uh, big banks in the United States control the uh, corporations in the United States, and it's incredible through interlocking directorates and stock ownership with they, I guess, uh, did you see much of this while you were there on the committee? Uh, not in the detail that he had looked at it, but it's obviously very clear. Uh, the one thing that I picked up from Wright Patman was his bill to audit the Federal Reserve, and I only made minor modifications to it. I dug that out, and, and he, of course, was a champion of uh, openness in government. He wanted to know what the Federal Reserve was doing, and he never, finally, I think in his older uh, years, they had voted him out of that power position. You know, even before he was out of the Congress, he lost his position. They put in Henry Royce, who was much more controlled uh, by the uh, banking people. But uh, uh, he uh, he was a good person, and he wanted more openness. I don't know if he was as strong on the gold standard as I am, but he certainly was against the type of banking system and how the how the banking system and the Federal Reserve serve the interests of the bankers and large corporations. Do the bankers control the mass media the way they control other major industries in the United States? Probably so, and certainly a lot of people say that. I guess I hesitate only that I don't have, you know, the proof sitting in my hand, but I think it's very clear. I can see it in government, and I saw it in banking, and certainly it can't be surprising if they're involved with other large corporations why uh, the media wouldn't be very much involved, too. Uh, it would be more of a surprise to find that not to be the case, but I don't think I could take them into court right now and uh, give them that proof that is necessary, but I think those who have studied it uh, feel that that is the case. Can you see uh, this scenario, assume that you're elected president of the United States, you're sitting in the Oval Office, can you see yourself signing uh, 
a bill or a directive abolishing the Federal Reserve? Well, a lot would have to happen. You know, if, um, if I went there and I was a libertarian president and the Congress remained the same and the spending was continuing and the people still wanted all this big government, no, I can't, I can't sign a bill because it wouldn't have been passed.